26 to 29. They read, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many of the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's name. Scott and doing an excellent job leading those songs. A lot of enthusiasm, and uh, I really do appreciate it. Even if he is my son. <laughs> so that's great. Well, we're going to be looking at our scripture reading this morning. Uh, as you know, we have uh, kind of reversed the order of worship today. We'll be having the Lord's Supper after we study about the Lord's Supper. But that felt like it would be a lot more beneficial to us uh, while it's still fresh in our minds. Uh, Brother Virgil was supposed to lead his song service today. He's not able to be with us. You know, recently he had back surgery. Well, yesterday he started having some trouble, and this morning uh, he is uh, having spasms, spasms in his back. And evidently, uh, they thought that might happen because he had some pills to take, uh, which he had not had to take before now. So we pray that all is well, that the surgery still proves to be uh, successful, and that he'll be permanently removed from pain. Now, as we look at our scripture reading this morning, we are reminded that on the night of his betrayal, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Institute what we know as the Lord's Supper. And in Luke's account of the same event, uh, we often call the Last Supper, he records that Jesus added the words, Do this in memory of me, in remembrance of me. Look at verses 19 and 20 of Luke chapter 22. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord has called upon us, his believers, to remember him in a supper. Evidently, there are reasons why Jesus wanted, wanted us to keep him in our memory. And so he instituted the supper. You know, memories are developed when we study Jesus' life and mission. The more we study about Jesus and we study about the life that he lived and the death he died and why he did that, the more it means to us. I fear that oftentimes in church services, People will partake of the Lord's Supper more or, less, more or less like a ritual. It's something that we're supposed to do, and we will argue we are supposed to do that every first day of every week, and that's right. But because of our ignorance of Scripture, we really don't understand what we're doing. And so I'd like to do something, whatever I can, to correct that. In the next several weeks, maybe a couple of months, because we won't be doing this every week, but we will have a number of different lessons on different parts of the Lord's Supper that I hope will make the Supper itself more meaningful to us. So that when we're sitting there partaking of the emblems, our minds are not wandering on something else. But rather that we are concentrating on what we're doing because of what Jesus has done. And what he has done for you. And what he has done for me. And so let's consider some things we should remember. When we as a church gather together around this table every first day of the week. To partake of the supper. What I'd like for us to do first of all. Is consider 
one of the elements of that supper. And that is the blood. If you continue with Luke's reading, in verse 20 it says, Likewise, uh, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is, uh, is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. It is a covenant of blood. It was made in blood. It is a new covenant under which we live. No Jew living under the old law was able to partake of this covenant because God did not make this covenant with them. With them. He's made that covenant with us. And he also made it with them that they become children of God through Jesus Christ. And so this then is called a new covenant. And Jesus says it's a new covenant in blood. Jesus died for us in order to purchase us with his blood. Why do we need to be purchased? Because we sold out to sin. That's why. We became children of Satan, of, of the devil, because of sin. <coughs> if we can remain in that state, we can never hope to exceed God. And I want to see God someday, don't you? Not only do I want to see him, I want to be with him in eternity. Now, Jesus has made that possible for us through his sacrifice on the cross. Do we remember that this is the very center point of the gospel, even as stated by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Look, for instance, at verses 3 and 4. For I deliver to you first of all that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the very heart of the gospel message. It's where our salvation is to be found. Christ shed his blood on that cross only after he died. Now, the apostle John, who was present at the cross, makes that very clear to us in his gospel. As the day wore on and the Sabbath was about to come, the soldiers were concerned about hastening the deaths of the three people that were hanging on crosses that day. And what did they do? They went about breaking their legs, didn't they? And here's what we read in John chapter 19 and verse 33. But when they came to Jesus, and so that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. You see, Jesus was dead. He shed his blood in his death. Now, why is that important to us? Well, because there is power in that blood. According to the Old Testament, life is found in the blood. You find that a couple of times in Leviticus chapter 17. That's why the Jews were forbidden from eating blood, drinking blood. You had the restrictions on things that were strangled, and meat had to be drained of blood before it could be consumed. Here's the reason that the Hebrew writer gives us in verse 22 of chapter 9. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Now listen. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That was true of the Jews under the Old Testament. It's true of us living under the New Testament. And yet, as we continue reading here in Hebrews, we cross over into chapter 10, and we learn that animal blood 
will not do. It was a temporary thing. Here's what the writer has to say concerning that kind of blood. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Now, if their blood couldn't do it, what blood could? It was Jesus' blood. Where do we come into contact with his blood in his death? When he died upon the cross. By the way, that's what makes baptism so important to us today. Because it is in baptism that we come into contact with his death. Because there we are buried with Christ in order that we might be raised with him. When do we contact the blood? When we're buried with him in baptism. Why is that important to us? Because without the shedding of his blood, there is no remission of our sins. We still have our sins. Now the writer goes on to say in the next couple of verses, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, that's what they had under the old covenant, but a body you have prepared for me. Now we're not going to be talking about the body today, which is represented by the bread. We're talking about blood today. But it's all part of the body, isn't it? And so here the Lord says, but a body you have prepared for me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Why? Because under those sacrifices, there was no forgiveness. We only postponed it until such time as Christ would die. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do your will, O God. And what did Jesus do? He died for us on the cross, didn't he? Why is that important for us? Because in his death, he shed that precious blood by which we are saved. Do you remember those statements that we find in the book of Revelation? Even the very first chapter where we start looking at the seven churches of Asia. In verse 5 of chapter 1, we find uh, these words. I'll go back and pick up with verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from, from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins, how? In his blood. And then we move on through the book of Revelation, and we come to chapter 5, and we find and we see a beautiful scene before the throne of God, for all the living creatures and so on, the redeemed are there, and we are told they sing a new song, a song that we ought to be singing now. In fact, that was our opening song. Remember what we sang at the beginning? I have been redeemed. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, what are they singing? Verse 9 of chapter 5, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Truly, we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. His body, the church, has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. That's us collectively. You remember in the reading of uh, the Apostle Paul as he has that meeting with the Ephesian elders, a place called Miletus. Here's what the Apostle had to say to them. 
Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Notice, I am innocent of the blood of all men. <coughs> no guilt here. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with what? His own blood. We are the body of Christ. We are the church of Christ. We have been purchased, bought back, redeemed as what we're about to see, by the precious blood of Jesus. So we should remember Jesus because of his blood that bought us from sin. We, nevertheless, we were bought with a price. What was that price? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning verse, verse 19, we find an incentive for us to live righteously before him because his spirit dwells within us. But there's more to be said here. For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your salvation had a price tag, and it was expensive. Yeah. It should be everything. And then we also read in chapter 7 and verse 23, and here he's talking about marriage of all things. But he says, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of sin. Now think about those two phrases together. We sold out the sin. We became slaves of sin. Jesus came to release us from slavery to sin. He did that by his blood. You know, don't be foolish as the Jews were in John chapter 8 said, we were never enslaved to anybody. You probably know people who are enslaved to sin. You may know people who are enslaved to alcohol or to drugs or even nowadays to sex. Only trouble is our society doesn't want to talk about sin because they don't want to talk about the cost of sin. So they say, well, that is a disease. And yet if you have the disease of alcoholism and you're found driving a car, why do you go to prison as a criminal if you're only suffering from a disease? We are talking about sin here. The very first thing people seem to want to do is deny sin. They need to deny sin. Well, why do I need to be saved from sin? What does the blood of Christ mean to me? It should mean everything to me. If I'm honest with myself, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we have done various times in life no no's. We have done wrong. We know that. Don't lie to, to yourself. We know that we sin. You see, this is characteristic of false prophets and false teachers who deny that we have been purchased. You think this is a surprise to God? It's the very thing that Peter talked about in 2 Peter 1, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, that's you and me, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. What do I need Jesus for? I deny that he bought me from anything. I'm my own person. 
Can't you see the pride in me? How proud I am that I don't need God, I don't need Jesus, I do not need salvation from sin. That's destructive heresies. It destroys people's souls. And he says not only that, but bring on themselves swift destruction. But nevertheless, we have been justified by Christ's blood. What does justify mean? What well, means just if I never sinned? In other words, when Jesus justifies us through his blood, it's as though we have never sinned because our sins are forgiven. But they're not forgiven apart from his blood. Notice what Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were you're still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified, how? By his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So redemption and forgiveness is found only in his blood. In other words, they cannot be found outside of blood. There is no forgiveness apart from the shedding of blood. Let's look at a couple of other scriptures in that regard. For instance, in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And then again we read this time from Colossians 1 and verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You get the feeling that there's a truth that God wants us to understand and to know. It's repeated over and over and over again. And when we stand before the table and we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, are those thoughts going through our mind? Are we remembering him for what he has done? Do, you, do we value that blood? You see, not only does that blood redeem us and save us from our sins, but as long as we are walking according to his way, faithfully, John calls it in the light, our sins are being continually forgiven. But it is a condition. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. The word cleanses there is in the present tense. It has the idea of linear action, continually cleansing us from sin. Because we do sin. But we receive the remission of sins as long as we are walking in the light. We can't be walking in darkness and expect that benefit. So in his death upon the cross, Jesus gave us the divine plan for salvation. And made it possible for all peoples, nations, and tongues to be saved. Just before Jesus ascended back into heaven, he issued the Great Commission, in which he indicated that the gospel was to be preached throughout the world. Several different references to this, one of them being found in Mark 16, 15 and 16, where they are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Not long after that, in Acts chapter 2, ten days after giving that commission, the gospel plan was carried out for the first time in Jerusalem. People were learning how God was going to forgive them of their sins so that they would be in a right relationship 
with God. How beautiful that is. And on that day, the day of Pentecost, when the church was established, Peter proclaimed the gospel message. People heard it. They believed it. They responded to it. They were convicted of their sins. And what did they do? They cried out. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Let's look at those verses once again, beginning with verse 36 in Acts 2. Therefore, as Peter brings his sermon to a close, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do about what? What we've done to the Lord that we have crucified. What are we to do about our guilt? What are we to do about our sin? Is what they were asking. And Peter gave to them the only answer that Jesus the Christ has ever authorized. It is the Answer that Jesus authorized Peter to give in order to receive the remission of their sins. Here's Peter's response. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, that's where we're going to come into contact with. The blood of the new covenant. The blood that cleanses us of our sins so that we are forgiven of our sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. You know what that means? That means it's for you and it's for me. I have the privilege of benefiting from the same blessing that is being offered to these Jews on the day of Pentecost. So when we gather around the Lord's table this morning, in just a few minutes actually, let us concentrate on the fact that Jesus purchased us with his blood. Our salvation is found in that blood. The cup in the supper reminds us of Christ's blood. Not too long ago in our Wednesday night class, we looked at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. Remember how that reads? Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Blood and body. We're concentrating on the blood today. And so when we are about to take in that cup, we are being reminded of that blood. That blood that forgives us of our sins. That saves us. That purchases us. That redeems us. It is indeed the blood of the new covenant that we need for our salvation. In order to be right with God. What's the word? Just enough. So we're in a right relationship with him. And we come together as a body of Christ because of that blood. I want you to consider Ephesians 2 and verse 13 for it reads, 
But now in Christ, talking about now talking about Jew and Gentile, remember they were separated. They were separated by the law, weren't they? And Jews had nothing to do with Gentiles, and Gentiles had nothing to do with Jews. You who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Can you think of any other way that people of the world can be unified in a loving relationship without this taking place? You see, what's been going on in the last couple of months in certain of our cities, anti-Semitism, that type of thing, People want to kill Jews and the Jews. The Jews have nothing to do with Christians and all that. Why is that? Because they have never learned to come together into one body through the blood. We can have all kinds of social programs that we want to, but it will never be accomplished apart from the blood. That goes right down to the very souls of people. It makes us the kind of people that we ought to be. Yes, there's power in that blood. Because I don't want to talk about it, but that sounds so morbid. Well, you don't seem to have any problem going to some of the movies you see. And that's for nothing, for no reason at all, except for entertainment. This blood changes you. This blood saves you. It gives you life. How beautiful it is. And so I invite us all, as we partake of the fruit of the vine this morning, let us focus now that we have reviewed what the New Testament teaches us about blood. Let us focus upon the blood of Christ. Reflect upon the things that we have just outlined. If you want to, you have an outline right here in your hand, don't you? If you need re remembrance as we're partaking, look at it. Consider the scriptures. Don't let your mind wander. Focus upon that communion. He's communing with us as we commune with one another. The lesson is ours to consider this morning. I hope this will prove to be beneficial to us all. If you have a contact with the blood of Christ, you have an opportunity right now to do that very thing. We saw what those people did on the day of Pentecost. They heard that message. They believed it. They were convicted by it. They responded to it. They repented and were baptized. Having come into contact with that blood, they experienced the remission of their sins. What is your desire? Why not make it known altogether to these things?
almost be more compared to what it's suffering.
there's nothing more I could really add scripture-wise that Mother Joan had covered so very much. I just want to read one more time before we partake of these emblems. Matthew 26, uh, 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And oh, what a wonderful moment that will be. I would like to call our brother Bob for the blessing of this bread, remembering what he means, and how blessed we are and privileged and honored to have this time to dedicate to our Lord and Savior. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this time, thanking you for the things you give us to survive here on this earth, all the blessings you've given us. The most important of this worship service, the communion of you, you've given us two emblems to remember your death on the cross. At this time, we will partake of the unleavened bread, which represents your body, sacrificed on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is power, power, wonder-working power, and the precious blood of the Lamb. Now that we've partaken of the bread, now we focus on that cup, and what it represents, that power in the blood, the precious blood that Christ shed on the cross for us. That blood that washes over us, cleans us free from our sin. What an honor it is, and as we focus on that, that gift that he gave us, just say holy, 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 and thank you, Lord God Almighty. Let the call of Mother Shresh for the blessing of the fruit of the Oh, this precious blood that was given for us, Heavenly Father. There is a new covenant in this blood and his blood was shed that our sins may be forgiven for us to remind that we have been bought with a price heavenly father at this time we gather here to bless this cup as it is emblematic to the blood of christ on the cross of Calvary, which redeems us from our sin father we take this moment to remember that great sacrifice, the memorial was done on our behalf. Lord, this time we partake of it, but before we do that, we examine ourselves in that our partaking is pleasing in your sight. For in Jesus' name we pray.
foods the Lord's Supper. Uh, now we have the other manner of communions. We have the opportunity to give back to the Lord, um, especially in what we learned about today. The uh, reasons why we give back, God gave so freely of uh, God, including his son. This is an opportunity for us to uh, give back in kind a, a portion that he had blessed us with to just keep these doors open, keep that message ringing out loud about that precious power of blood. Brother Henderson, do you have the blessing to the offer? Dear Heavenly Father, so grateful for all that you have provided for us, all the things that you give us on this earth. You gave us everything, God. You did many years ago with your uh, sacrifice on the cross, God. We're so grateful. Have us give back to you, God, this day, the honor of you, this sacrifice, Father, and um, be with us and give us strength. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This August 1st, at 5 p.m., the people of Warsaw, Poland, will pause for one minute. And it will be the 76th celebration of the remembrance of the Warsaw Uprising, the attempt to try and free that city from the Nazi um, uh, engagement in their town. They take that time regularly, annually, to not forget. You guys in that on this table, we have a tendency. So thank you, Brother Joe, for bringing us this lesson to help us gather our thoughts when the time comes for this. But it's not something we have to wait for a weekly basis to remember. Um, you have been bought with that blood. Each, each moment of your life that you're spending, you're, you're not yours. You're, you're his. You belong to him. You put him on. You made that choice. The best choice of your life to put on Christ. So, thank you again, Brother Joe, for those wonderful comments um, today, the sermon that you brought us to help gather those, those thoughts. And as he mentioned, hold on to this. These are some incredible uh, scriptures to look back to and remember on and focus and prepare yourself. Uh, even the men who lead to the table it's nice, uh, especially for those who maybe start for the first time leading, who now are inspired to want to leave the table. It took me a while to first agree to come up here because I wasn't sure how to focus my thoughts. This really helps. Um, so thank you again. And before we have close uh, today, before we have close the prayer, are there any announcements that we need to make before? Anybody? All right. It's an incredible encouragement to see each and every one of you here today. Um, we are all part of that body. And when any one of you are not with us, it's felt. It's, it's, you are missed greatly. So thank you uh, for your presence here. Um, I hope you are encouraged just as much as I am, seeing each of your faces.
Who is the closing prayer today? Brother Johnson, would you please lead us? We all please rise for the closing prayer. We, lead, we will be dismissed.